Well, good day, everyone, and welcome to Industrial Info's 2022-2023 Pharmaceutical Biotech Industry Outlook. I'm Peggy Tuck, and I will be your moderator today. This webinar is proudly sponsored by Aviva, sparking industrial ingenuity by connecting people with trusted information and insights in order to drive responsible use of the world's resources. Aviva solutions help companies as well as manufacturers streamline and optimize production operations and ensure quality and traceability all while ensuring product integrity and regulatory compliance. You know, while the pandemic created a wave of demand for new diagnostics, treatments, and vaccines, it also created some threats to the global pharma and biotech supply chain. So over the next hour, IIR's uh, industry experts are going to take an in-depth look at the pharma biotech industry and how they are building greater flexibility and capacity through project spending, not only this year, but looking ahead to next as well. Our presenters today are Shaheen Shohan, IIR's Vice President of Global Analytics, Shaheen has been with IIR for 11 years, and he's based in Industrial Info's Dubai office. He has a background in consulting, strategic marketing, and analytics. And of course, joining him is Annette Kruger, IIR's global research leader for the pharmaceutical biotech industry. Annette has over 20 years of reporting on competitive intelligence and market research within the biotech and pharma industries, focusing on capital investment, trends, growth patterns, as well as analytics. Now, both will be taking your questions following the presentation. So if you would like to submit a question, just look over to the side of your screen and you'll see an area to submit it. Please feel free to submit any of your questions at any time during the presentation. And then following today's webinar, we would like to invite you just to take part in a very brief survey. So let's get started. It's my pleasure to, Annette, uh, to introduce Annette Kruger, IIR's Global Research Leader for the Pharmaceutical and Biotech Industry. Thank you so much, Peggy, and thank you to Aviva for sponsoring this webinar, and welcome to all of you. A um, lot going on in the industry. It's in the news every day. There's no surprise. I'm not going to read this. I just want to give an overview. This is everything when we say pharmaceutical biotech. Think life sciences, all of these different sectors are what we do cover in our data in industrial info on our pharma bio platform. There's challenges, there's things pushing the industry. Uh, obvious one right off the bat, there's a continued demand for COVID-19 products, the vaccines, the treatments. Um, that is spurring, obviously, a lot of growth. Uh, that tends to be more international at this point than domestic. Um, all the technologies you're reading about and hear about and even get offered when you have a malady. We're all getting older around the world. Uh, as you age, you need more drugs and uh, you need different kinds of medications. And I will say that the United States, we have seen all the money that they've put towards boosting us having the right drugs for this pandemic to meet this pandemic, uh, billions of federal dollars, we're seeing that around the globe. We're seeing it in the Mideast. We're seeing it in Japan. We're seeing it in Europe. Not to the degree we had, had it here, but it is happening. And that's a pretty interesting trend that in, in some cases, they've gone from never having like just a small molecule drug production uh, in a third world country. You can't get you know, antibiotics, and they're putting in advanced biological manufacturing plants. Challenges, well, they abound. You know, in Boomtown, it, it, that saying, the best of times, the worst of times, the environmental mandate. The pharmaceutical industry is a high energy user. And every single company of any note has a net zero policy, a goal. Some say in 10 years, some say in five. It varies, but it is an important part of planning for every pharmaceutical company and the manufacturing plants. And there's all kinds of incentives tied into that. Um, 
there's a lot of things that uh, are true up above and are true down below, which is weird, opposing forces. The demand for COVID-19 products, you've got a severe apathy going on. A lot of people did everything. They're just done. They don't, they don't want any more drugs. They don't, they don't want it. For everyone that does, there's someone that doesn't. So that's a challenge for the industry because there's a lot of capacity out there. There's a lot of product. So that is one of the challenges. Uh, the FDA, uh, they're, they're claiming they're going to do more digital oversight of the manufacturing process. And they're delaying. It was supposed to be streamlined, but the drug approval process. And there's been a lot of delays and a lot of drugs just getting abandoned, going all the way through the uh, trial phases and then getting abandoned because of a, a bad result or the threat of the FDA is going to find something. And there is a question about government funding having peaked. I didn't read each one. I don't want to read each one, but money's got to stop sometime. And the question is how many of these companies that literally strung, sprung out of nowhere with COVID, um, are they going to still be around when uh, that money ends? Uh, a lot of the companies that were formed did not exist prior to COVID. And we had a lot of venture capitalists. They've taken a big, big jump into the industry. Huge. Now, what they've done, they all get together, form these companies, and they started poaching executives from the major drug companies. They have the money. They had government money. The thought is some of it will come to be and some will go away. That remains to be seen, what's going to happen. Oh, an industry want list, if you may. You know, we hear all about the supply chain in every industry. You know, whether you're sitting at home wanting to know, well, I can't get my favorite product, to absolutely having the materials to make product to sell to people, to give to people. And uh, that's a want. They want a guarantee of that or guarantee that it's going to flow and not stop. And the industry as a whole did very well. A lot of the shortages that were expected didn't happen. Or if they did happen, they didn't last as long. Somehow it still made it through. Uh, this managing equipment, uh, the track and trace, digitization, you hear all of this kind of thing. It's essential because the sooner that a company can know if there's a problem, there's a quality control management, all of these different programs. That's just one of a thousand that will say, is this a problem on this machine, on this process? Do we have to escalate it? The more they have everything transparent, everything linked, they can find a problem before it escalates and shuts a plant down. Uh, that's a want. Is it happening? To a degree, it really is, but it's a want. Optimize inventory warehouse management. We're seeing a lot of warehousing going up. Advanced, you'll hear smart, a smart factory, Amgen building one in Ohio, you know, almost a half a billion dollars. That thing is calibrated to the inch. They know exactly where everything's going, why it's going there, how much is going. These are smart factories, less employees, more management, digital management. Skilled workforce, so, that plays into that. Um, some of these advanced manufacturing plants, uh, they're having a hard time finding people, which is kind of shocking. When you, if you heard some of the names, uh, the kind of incentives they're offering for people to work in their manufacturing plants. It used to be not so hard to put somebody in a sixty to $100,000 a year production job. Well, they're offering sign-on bonuses. Uh, on the other hand, a lot of this is being handled by automation and robotics because they don't really have to worry about that and it keeps the nature of the drug right. The cleaner it is, the less human intervention, the easier it is to keep track and make sure the, that the purity remains throughout that life. Every so one Annette, of before, things, before we move on, on, on that, if I could just jump in and stay on that topic. Sure. You've talked in the past about how the, I guess, the supply chain across 
farm, the farmer and biotech market is, is changing in terms of what I mean by that is is, is the, the, the the operating model. You've talked what we can see here is there's more automation being added into plants. There's also the process, the production is, is changing. It's moving to a continuous process, correct? Is 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 that is that altering the kind of the composition and the makeup of how a new these complex pharma facilities are being built and, and does that change the type of capex that goes into them? Well, it, do you know how long they've been talking about we're going to continuous processing in pharma, it's much more efficient. And they are, but not, it's not universal. Not yet. The new plants, absolutely, a lot of it. But for every plant that's doing continuous, there's still people doing running batch. Uh, for such an advanced, technology-rich field as the pharmaceutical industry. They are slow to change. We've got a lot of little working parts. The goal is, you've heard the internet of things, everybody's heard that, Pharma 4.0. It's to have everything from the time that drug is discovered as a viable drug and approved right time to when the patient takes it, that it can be, tra it can be tracked. Everything is managed digitally. That is how starting, Shaheen, some of these new plants, like I said, that's a smart plant, but not mm. every plant built is a smart plant. And you've got your standard plants that, you know, making the small molecule drugs, the uh, ones we're used to, antibiotics, uh, anti-cholesterol drugs. Um, there's some changes going on there, but not as much as you would, would think. For every time I report on a single-use system, a disposable bioreactor, well, then we uncover, oh, well, look, they're replacing their stainless steel reactors, they're upgrading it. So there, there's room for both, but there's no universal change right now. We are seeing more modular coming in because the plug and play when you're approaching a area that, uh, let's say in Africa, that you might have some uh, utility problems, you know, your infrastructure, that takes a lot of the headache away because you've got your plant constructed and you can just pop it in and hook it up the, the work will go into the infrastructure, bringing it there. But it's absolutely, I mean, this is on everybody's uh, want list. Let's, let's deploy this and make it happen. But the old school plants aren't going anywhere right now. It works, it's inexpensive, they can keep manufacturing the over-the-counter drugs with standard prescription drugs. Global, this is exciting. We've expanded our coverage across the globe. Um, you know, you just can't all of a sudden say, all right, we're gonna cover it. It takes some time to develop the uh, skill levels and the training and the knowledge, but we are growing. And something's interesting that you'll see, uh, what's going on in North America is actually pretty much going on in Europe, Asia, Latin America. There's differences. But what we see building here, which of course is the biggest, we've got almost you know over 55 billion under construction. You might go, oh my goodness, you know, is there any opportunities left? Well, before we go to the planning and engineering, there's always opportunities in projects under construction. We'll go to close out a project and we find out they've expanded it. They're pushing it out. They've added, added on. So that 125 billion under construction right now. Those aren't past opportunities. There are a lot of opportunities. Um, obviously, North America, that's where we started, but that's not why the most spending is there. That's where the most spending is, the CapEx spending its time, followed by the others. Um, these emerging countries and our coverage, as it expands, these numbers will increase. No, the most important thing to me on this is the projects in the planning stage. That's exciting. Those are, you know, those aren't all filled up with all the suppliers and contractors and architects. A lot of opportunities there. Um, it's an exciting time when you're talking about almost 100 billion across the globe, and this is this is going up every day. This is increasing because the same needs. The only irony in this is like when I mentioned Africa, where there's been a dearth of drugs there of the regular small molecule. Drugs, and I'm not talking in the large cities. There's been some, but it's never been a 
Well, they're going to advanced biologicals now. So there's got to be a balancing. You will see more of the, uh, along with those advanced plants that the government's taking, you will see more of small molecule uh, CapEx investment there because, you know, people want to be cured of regular things instead of the more personalized medicines. Um, Oceana, uh, one, kind of... my, one ob my one observation, uh, looking at the numbers in the two little boxes at the bottom, is there's about 30, must be around $30 billion of projects sitting at, I guess, the engineering stage. Would you say, and we, we present many of these webinars throughout the course of the year, would you say that the pharma and biotech industry typically has a, uh, a high realisation rate, i.e. projects going from planning through oh, the engineering absolutely. into construction? Absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely. But what we're finding, um, we're finding a little caution because, um, well, I'll get to that in another slide, but yes, we've got a high realization rate. I mean, it's odd. Uh, my team's actually all over the globe. I love them because they actually take, they get offended if a project's canceled. <laughs> I'm like, that's part of life. I mean, that's logistics. With all the mergers and acquisitions going on and reorganization, um, it's a shocker when we cancel a project. It might take longer, it might change uh, in length and scope and PIV, total investment value, but we've got like a 85, 90% realization rate. This is a, just give you a different look at it. Um, it's across the globe, everything. It shows you what's under construction, and again, what's important here, there's some people that will never be attracted to something under construction. You're missing opportunities if that's the case. But we've got all that under construction, but there's more in planning. 53 billion, they've got the funds. They're what we call an E-stage. They've got the funding, but they haven't started yet. And then planning, that's where the, you know, the second largest amount is. And we are literally adding this every day, adding to the database. Um, I'm not sure though, these, you know, just like drivers at the pump, these, these fuel costs are cause for concern. It doesn't mean they're going to stop producing, but it does have an impact. Uh, CMOs, CDMOs have been, they were already growing prior to the pandemic. Well, that sent them into the stratosphere. They're here to stay. They are here to stay. They have projects instead of the little five million, two million, ten million, which there's plenty of those. They 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 were spending hundreds of millions of dollars to build up capacity across the globe for everything. And the one thing you see right there on the screen, flexibility. That's the key word. They can make just about anything a drug company wants. And drug companies are much more flexible. They they consider them partners now. Annette, before no. we move on, the, the, the outsourcing model, the CMO and CDMO, um, does an outsource partner, is, 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 is that company able to take ownership of the supply chain across multiple uh, indus, uh, multiple from multiple uh, pharma companies, or can are they limited to any and exclusive with one company? It all depends on the person, you know, the, the particular agreements. There is no one standard. It is all between, if Pfizer is going to use Catalent, they're going to have their own parameters for how this is done. You can't, there's no universal way of saying it, like, you must do this, you must do that. What I have found, though, I can't believe the level of the partnerships that's going on and the, rely, you know, the reliability that they're relying on these companies to come out and make product for them. But as you get into more, um, and it's not just for the specific uh, personalized medicine, if you will, uh, it's across the board. Some of these drugs have a smaller run where you don't need a whole brand new plant and they can get dedicated production lines because they get a higher dollar for the end product. And that's where the CMO, CDMO uh, comes to the table. And this is across the globe. This is happening across the globe where uh, they're relying on them. But when you get into the raw materials and like their API supply, same challenges are faced, but 
they can't just decide that where they're going to source the product. They've got to prove in many cases to the manufacturer that they can supply, you know, that, that they, they can get their hands on it, but it's not a matter of, hey, we found this, so we'll use it in your drug. Th those are highly layered contracts between the manufacturers and the CMOs, CDMOs. You were talking earlier, Shaheen, about things happening. The pharma industry has, we, we rate them, what's high? Well, you know, a high opportunity of uh, coming to fruition, medium and low. I mean, that's pretty obvious. Um, I make the teams, I, I encourage them, come on, let's, let's pull back a little bit. Let's do medium until we get the money. And we know for a fact in these, like I said, a project can be in an early stage and go through so many different uh, mutations by the time it actually makes it to construction. But um, the ones on the, the first column, those are pretty much a lock. Those are going to happen. Doesn't mean it never, they can't just stop one. You know, 20 years ago, Bear was building a big plant, Crystal, whatever the brand was, it was an anti cholesterol drug in Kansas, $200 million plant. And they stopped because the drug, the drug went off bad. So it does happen. Uh, the most important thing I want you to get from this is to look at where our highest, where's the most activity? What types of projects? It's always going to be plant expansion. When companies build a facility, I don't care if it's a grass root or a brownfield, they are planning on expanding. They're not saying, well, that's as far as our business is going to go. We just need this amount of space. So plant expansion are our highest sector. They always will be. New plant construction is consistent. I keep thinking there's going to be an end to it, but there's not. And for every grassroot plant, they like grassroot in many cases because it's all built to order. But brownfields, those old buildings, a lot of buildings lend it to themselves. And that's where our real estate investment trusts and developers come in. That's something important that everybody should be keeping an eye on, real estate investment trusts like Alexandria, Biomed, and scores of others that are popping in because they will build these so-called spec buildings, but they're not really spec because they're spending hundreds of millions of dollars to build these towers. It was the East and West Coast, but now it's, it's spreading. There's some in Texas, middle, middle America, everywhere because the drug companies like that very much because going back to the uh, whole environmental and fuel problem issues pricing. These are clean buildings. These are so clean, they are, that, that's a hallmark. They cost more, but they work with the manufacturers. And the goal isn't to get 20 small companies in a 300,000 square foot tower. They used to be just offices and labs. First they were offices years ago, then they became labs. Now they're actually building manufacturing into them and not just clinical scale. Uh, there's a lot of activity on that. And um, a lot of them do brownfields. You take an old, so a brownfield could be a building that was so-called spec that's really not spec. They very seldom build something to that magnitude without expecting, without knowing what the market's going and what the demand is, the demand's high for it. Implant capital, consistent, absolutely consistent. And we're uncovering more of it. That goes back to what I said, when we're talking about smart plants and single-use systems and continuous, some of that does fall into that in the existing plant. I remember when Merck first started, uh, they, they weren't the first, but they first started in some of their existing plants, instituting continuous. And they were smaller projects, but they were getting certain product lines, certain plants to begin. You got to test this stuff. Because when you go to continuous from batch, you have to reapply to the FDA for the modifications in the production process, even if the end result is the same. Anytime you change something, it can cause a burp, but it is much more efficient. Maintenance, um, always, if you don't maintain, uh, and it's all going to, that's very smart. You know, not the standard plants, not some of the smaller plants, but we're seeing an uptick in the use of long-term service agreements. 
that actually are in place, and that's their go-to. They handle the maintenance. A lot of them handle the implant capital. Just keep in mind something here. Virtually every manufacturer of any size has an annual capital budget that does not account for expansion. It just accounts for anything going on in the plant. So it could be something, that's where those little 300,000, 500,000, 3 million unidentifiable projects, they exist. They have to, a capital budget could run. That's different than going to corporate for the big expansions. So there are beyond opportunities. A lot of them will just say, hey, we're shoving some equipment in during that maintenance. I got some money left over. And opportunities, I guess, is the key word here. And Annette, before we move on, maybe you could just uh, explain a little bit about uh, those colored boxes, what we mean by our probability factors. Just let folks know what your research oh, that's is what doing I meant. when they The green that. is high. That's yeah. that We're very confident that's going to move forward. Mm -hmm. Medium, well, it's probably going to happen, but we're not saying full boron that's going forward. And truthfully, low is a judgment call. It's people have some pie in the sky. If, I'm, if I've got a project where they've done a, two phases on a grassroots facility, and they're like, well, yeah, we're going to, you know, we're looking at the third phase. We want a third building. Well, why don't we finish building the first two first? So that's what's going to fall into low or a startup company that doesn't necessarily have the backing. That's what falls, falls into that. Yeah, and, again, and I think I think I think also uh, it's important to note that many that the, these ratings actually move around on an individual project by project basis. So something that could be currently assigned as a low rated uh, project for whatever reasons, and the reasons that could could define it being low is lack of funding, or there's some permitting issues, or absolutely uh, there's some, some logistics issues. But over time, as market conditions or the conditions surrounding, uh, surrounding that project improve or change, it can then move through the kind of the, the, the traffic lights and, and ultimately become a, a, high, a high priority project or high priority. Well, when you look at the projects. numbers, you know, uh, you got to have the facts behind the data, but data doesn't lie in this case. I mean, you look at the grand total at the bottom and you're exactly right. Now, don't get me wrong. I have had high projects rated high. And we try to touch those a little more than our scheduled uh, quality control, if you will, to check on projects, because it doesn't, it can happen. You can have something that's, that's a go that, yeah, we're going to curb that for a while. Um, that does happen. Yeah, they do shift. But we start out with very few low probability projects, unless I said it's one of those ones like, oh, well. Yeah, they're telling us what they their wish list is, if you'd like. We don't have the money. Well, that's, you know, great. <laughs> that doesn't help much. Okay. Now, here's something that's important that I, I was surprised at. You see the types of these projects? This holds true across the world. It's not just the United States, because we're looking at it globally. There's new plants going in all over the globe. They're expanding plants all over the globe. Uh, the ones that have a lot of plants, they're, they're upgrading them, trying to meet demand. More people are getting or have access to drugs. More people are aware of the power of medication than have ever, ever known that before. This is not one area. This is a universal truth, how these plants and the, the, the percentages by type uh, follow across the globe. So, you know, what are the leading sectors? We I mean, just look at those numbers, again, global. Everything we read about, everything we, some of us took, some of us didn't, all the different things that could go wrong with the human body, that, the advanced biologicals, that's what the first one is. All those things, a lot of money is being spent, and it's expected to keep that. That's where you're going to find a, your smart factory where you're going to find a lot of this, oh, this new revolution of what they've been wanting to do for 20 years and they're finally starting to do it in these new plants that are being built. But I'm gonna put a, um, cause it all makes sense. 
it's more efficient, all of it. But there's a little bit of a problem that's interesting. I was uh, one of the researchers was speaking to a plant, and as I said, history often predicates the future. CAR T therapies in the news, along with your genetics, uh, cellular genetic therapies, you'll hear CGT. Well, it's big CAR T development, two big projects, wrapping up construction soon, and there was talk of a third phase. They're pausing. They're not, they're going to wait because there might be overcapacity. Because everybody was building it. That's the problem with the industry sometimes. <laughs> Let's all build it. Um, doesn't mean it's going away, but it means they got to cool it a little bit. There's a little bit of easing back on some of this, um, but it's still strong. Interestingly enough, now if you're looking at pharma, that's your small molecule. That's just everything that you're used to. Those aren't going away. Uh, a lot of the people that are burnt out on the vaccines and being told, you know, you take this or do this or whatever, they they feel more comfortable with what you're going to find in a what's called a traditional pharma. Does it mean there are no side effects? No, but antibiotics, pain pills, um, a host of other maladies are still treated under that sector, and there's consistent spending in that sector. Um, are they employing the smart? Aspects, of course they are. It's more efficient, but it just doesn't have some of the same equipment, obviously, but it's from a different aspect. There's also, depending on the location of the plant, you know, uh, some basic plants, uh, you're making tableting, you know, a tablet. It's not as involved, and it's easier to contain, but it's not as involved as some other processes. Big one, obviously, active pharma ingredients. That's what makes a drug work, whatever kind of drug it is. And the, the fillers that go with it, the excipients, the, the fillers, if you will, um, adjuvants, that falls in there. An adjuvant, you've got an existing drug. Oh my goodness, it's going to go off patent. What can I do to boost this? What can I do? What can I add to it to make it more than it is? Or trying to get a patent. Uh, this drug is good, but it, there's another drug out there that's just as good. They're going to put an adjuvant that enhances whatever the goal is of that drug. Um, yeah, we want to make them here in the state. More proprietary gets made here in the state. China kind of rules this still. Um, there is a shift, but not as big as one would think. Um, but everybody's making APIs now. What's wonderful, I will say, to add to the flexibility, um, so are the CMOs, CDMOs for the drug companies. But then you have to understand that a lot of your raw materials still come from China, will come from China. So we just have to be careful when we're making these, making pronouncements of what will be. There's I ideal and then there's reality. But every one of these has an opportunity, no matter what you, how you serve the industry. I, it doesn't matter if you're in real estate, it doesn't matter if you sign, sell bells. There is so much to be, to, to be made right now. Medical devices, you know, look at your wrist. See if you're wearing a smartwatch. That's a medical device. There's, uh, this is going quickly. And they're coming up with the most unbelievable things. Uh, to produce, the plants are lower cost. Than an advanced manufacturing, you know, drug, chemical process, biological process. That doesn't mean there's no um, opportunities. And uh, you know, your big companies, uh, they're expanding. I mean, they got a big boost with COVID with tests uh, and the diagnostics. Diagnostics, not the material that tests it, not that liquid that you use in a test, but when they're mixing your blood, the actual kit. That falls under this too. And cannabis, we expected it was on a trajectory to get bigger when COVID hit, but they're just really, I'm telling you, every state in the United States, every province in Canada, every region across the globe, except for a few, the, the, they really see this as the future in many, many ways. 
um, there's a lot of application for medicinal. Once they separate the recreational from the medicinal, and it's federally approved, there's places all over the, they're just waiting. Some countries aren't waiting. Some companies aren't waiting. Oceana has been really making huge investments. And it's not just for pain. It's to help with appetite. It's for your skin. There are good properties in that that they hope to capitalize. And the timing actually, people have a bit of burnout on medication. And even though there's a um, negativity left over from the 60s and the 70s, oh, where we don't want to be potheads. We're not going to use cannabis. There are a lot of end uses that they're exploring there, and they really do work. It just has to be to FDA and CGMP, uh, Certified Manufacturing Practice. But I expect the, se the sector's here to stay, and it's just going to grow. On the other hand, everyone that makes medicinal will not make recreational, but a large amount of them will. They'll have a split, industry, a split company division, because there is a lot of money to be made in that also. We already covered CMOs, CDMOs, and that just keeps going. That will, you talk about uh, reshoring, sometimes people call it uh, outsourcing, obviously, or offshoring. This is a viable part of the industry. Excuse me for a minute. This, I'm not going to stay on this. I just want to show you, this is more what we're, it's a combination of growth of the industry along with industrial info expanding our coverage to give that in-depth coverage for the emerging markets. Over the last 12 months, we've grown 19%, which is not bad at all. We want more, and as people, as we grow, so our database grows as well. We go where the market wants us. Um, and, you know, it, it is growing. It's not a matter of just uh, saying, well, I think we're going to cover South Korea. You know, there's somebody wants, well, there's a lot of activity going on in this place. So, and I'd say across the globe, 57, 60%, if you took the whole globe for our percentage of coverage, and again, this is fluid, it's changing. So, we start with North America after going to the globe. I'm not going to point out anything other than it's not surprising that East and West Coast have a lot of future activity. This is a more drilled down one than the global one that I opened with. Um, a lot of that is being boosted by those real estate investment trusts and the developers. Uh, a lot of it's manufacturing plants. There's no one type of plant in all of this spending. What I want you to look at, again, $55 billion under construction in all the regions. And that's easily eclipsed by the total in planning and engineering. Future kickoff. Next 24 months, it's almost equal. And that you don't have to be in New Jersey. You don't have to be in California. It's everywhere across the United States. There's project activity. And it it is never more underscored than when I, you know, I go and refresh this and look. Mid Atlantic just went off the chain with heavy investment. I mean, you look, Mid-Atlantic, New England, West Coast, that's current. But they also, will they have as much coming up? I don't know if it can sustain that amount of growth that we went through over the past few years, three years, but it's going to always grow. We have a we have a bigger client base, and that's just the way it is. I'm talking the drug industry does. People always want to know what's going on where. Again. The reason for this is quite simple. What holds true here in North America holds true all over the world. Look at some of these projects, see what they're doing, what kind of projects are being built. And you'll see, oh, wait a minute. Huh, they're doing that in the UK. The only thing that I have found different, I picked manufacturing projects. The one shift that I have found if you're not researching, you're, you're, you're in trouble as a company. If you're not developing, refining new drugs. But one thing that I have seen different 
we were always the hotbed of research, and we still are. I didn't include those projects in this. A lot of people just want pure manufacturing, but we're seeing that happen in Europe, China, and India. More research centers. That's interesting. Um, they see the power in that. So their own companies, you know, one day may be global, but right now they're not. They're based there. They want to develop it. And it gives them more, you know, you have more power if it's your drug. So we're seeing a lot more of that. But these are impressive. Some of these are under construction, will be done. That very first one on the top, if anybody's ever worried about work in Texas, like what's going on in Texas? Fujifilm, this is a $2 billion project in North Carolina. They've invested that outside of College Station, right here in Texas. They said it was going to happen. It did. And it continues. You do not make that kind of investment and then stop spending. And the research center there, a national research center, again, everywhere, every region, every city virtually has something going on. And I mean, I, I'm pleasantly surprised all the time when new projects pop up. It's like, oh, never say never. They'll go, no more big plants. Well, that's a lie. There are. Uh, you, you notice the second biggest one up there is a CDMO, Contract Developer Manufacturing Organization. They're doing all kinds of stuff. Keyword, your takeaway from this is flexibility, being able to handle and adapt to multiple products. Um, we're seeing a lot more investment, public and private sectors coming together. So we go to Europe. When you have time, you're looking at this later, you'll see. it's the, the spread's almost identical, which is very strange. When you're looking at projects under construction, how many there are that are active, and then how many total with future, it, the, num the, the ratios don't change. Um, you would be remiss to overlook the opportunities in Europe um, for the same reasons it would be here in the United States or North America. Uh, they're smaller than us, but that they've got some of the most advanced manufacturing plants in operation and planned as anybody does across the world. Uh, Northern Europe, Western Europe kind of dominate. That's quite obvious. Uh, the interesting thing people ask about what's going on with the Ukraine war and how is that affected? There's that uncertainty. But, you know, one of the industry's biggest deals is in Eastern Europe. I'll say it that way for those countries. That whole area, at any given time prior to COVID, there was almost a thousand clinical, human clinical trials going. There's been a little hubbub about that not being able to happen. And because no matter what kind of IT that you use, no matter what, you know, artificial intelligence, you eventually have to test it on a human. And there's a, a human type, a human uh, standard that can be met in Eastern Europe for a lot of drugs. And um, that's, I'm not saying that all projects that we've got reported, they're not going to be impacted, but that's almost a bigger impact at this point. But again, it's a wild card. I certainly don't know what the result of the war is going to be, but we are monitoring that closely with our European offices, and that's, that's what we do. Um, so that's Europe and every type of project. A lot of federal funding. Those schools are building a lot up there. And they don't want to be seen as somehow less than anything in North America. They're certainly not. And, you know, your global companies are in both. But a lot are based in Europe. There you go. There's their projects. Just I, And I just took the top ten by total investment value. Same kind of projects that are being built. Here, there. Same, same drug classes. Same purpose. Now you look, AstraZeneca. They're they're building some APIs. That was a big announcement in Blanchardstown. That was a big announcement. That's a lot of money, and that's like, all right, we're gonna. That would fall under your supply chain capture, and we monitor all that. 
We do market trends on all of our data now, trying to capture why are they doing this, not only to have the product, but to avoid a catastrophe down the road. There's another one. Daughter can I can excuse me if I mispronounced anything. Same thing, API. So while there is some going on, it's just not to the degree that everybody had expected. And then you've got your advanced manufacturing. Not so different from what's going on. It's interesting when you look at that company that I mentioned on the last slide, Fujifilm. Well, they got about a billion dollar project going in Europe. So these are global companies and there's a reason you spend that kind of money in a country or region because you know you're going to have the customers. And boy, they're also a contract manufacturer. They're covering all their bases with what they'll do. They want to make the bulk drug product and the finishing start to finish there. All right, now Asia. We're growing in our coverage in Asia. But, um, you know, some, some places there was more coverage and we're really, we've had a lot of clients want Japan, South Korea, and we, we're boosting it. We're, we're actively growing those regions because they're viable. There's, there's business there and clients are interested in it. Look at that split. Now, this is beautiful because in this case, there's the least amount is under construction. The most is in planning. And I can say, without question, these numbers will grow. Uh, they're, they're simply um, part of our growth in it and expanding because these are valuable. And there is, you know, Japan's a small country, but there's a lot of activity. They were the, one of the largest markets in the world for pharma products. And this whole bit with COVID scared them because they also import a lot of their drugs and they they're boosting up i mean they're never going to be able to build some things there but there's a lot of project activity going on across all sectors of the industry um, they're trying to ensure that they have a little more protection in the face of adversity that all of a sudden because these people that population has been had access on par with europe and the united states it's a highly, highly uh, accessible, drug accessible country. And um, they not only are building new, but it's maintaining what they have. And then you get into the Republic of South Korea, that's what I call it. You'll see on the next slide, they are spending to beat the band advanced biological plans. And they're going global. So, and, and, and Annette, I mean, we've got we've got two sorts of uh, drivers here. We've got Japan, one of the biggest economies in the world, top economy, right. and also got a rapidly aging population. So I would assume <coughs> that spending and, and, and expansions would would be going on there. And then we've got obviously India and China, the two most populous uh, uh, nations on the planet, with extremely fast accelerating population rates with uh, very low, I guess, uh, a large base in the population, which has got low access to medical facilities and medicines and that sort right. of thing. Um, I'm assuming that we'll see these numbers grow over time. But oh, who, are the who are the companies who are building and constructing within these geographies? Are we seeing the Pfizer's, the Novartis's building there? Or are we seeing more indigenous type uh, Indian well, pharma companies, Chinese pharma companies? I do know that, like Pfizer, had a huge vaccine manufacturing center in China. They flipped it. There is, there are some global investments, but not to the degree that you would think in India and China. I'm not saying there's not partnerships. Partnerships are a big thing. That uh, again, just like in the in the past, that just didn't happen. Well, there's more sharing, there's more agreement. But a company is scared to invest all of that money. I mean, there's global manufacturing plants, but in an unstable, I mean, unstable country, I don't, I'm not casting judgment on China, but they can just come in and take your plant. <laughs> so there's a lot of risk involved. And if we look to the next, now a country like South Korea, 
India and Japan, they have their own company that are global players, or they want them to be more of a global player. Every one of them. So does China. Forget so much the global American, you know, the names we know from Europe and the United States. They have Wuxi from China. Dr. Reddy and these other names coming out of India. Japan. Well, here, let's look on that. Yeah, let's look at the next slide so we can look see the some of the slide. projects. Yeah. Now, in Japan, okay, Roche, that's fine. That's a global company. Those are some big projects. Nipro is Japanese. And there's plenty more. Like I said, I, I had to limit it. I went just to three. And I did put um, an R&D center there. That, you know, I said this is all manufacturing. The reason I did this was that's a big investment from Roche in Japan. And um, that's not to mean there aren't strong Japanese. The, the Japanese companies, of course, they want to dominate, but they also want to expand across their borders. They want to get on the, they want to join in, hey, what's Roche doing? I mean, that's how everybody refers to Roche. Or what's a GlaxoSmithKline considered on that same level? Now, if you look up at China, uh, those, are, I, those aren't on the top of everyone's tongue. They don't, those don't come to mind easily. There's so many layers to these companies in these countries, in, in China in particular. But you look at what they're doing. I didn't include all the research centers. They're going for the full bore. Before, you know, all right, we'll make our the APIs and we've got the raw materials. They're going, they they spawned our company Wuxi, which is just one, but it's a more recognizable name because they've expanded across the globe. They're here in the United States. They've spent hundreds of millions of dollars to be a contract manufacturer for advanced biological plants. And they've got a huge, huge complex, complexes in China. So that's the goal, you know, to answer your question. No, like I said, nobody, I mean, not nobody, but the general population, those aren't the names that come to mind when you're hearing a drug manufacturing company, but they're important. South Korea, Celtrion's not on here because there were some other big ones, but Celtrion is making a huge, huge push to grow. Not necessarily, this was strictly by money, but sometimes if you look at the amount of projects. But all of these, Samsung, I mean, they're, they have stated that they're devoted, I mean, they're going to make huge investments into the biosimilars, which are coming. They are here in many cases. They just haven't been met with universal approval. And the pandemic der derailed a lot of plans, but they're big onto that. And again, uh, providing contract services. Now, Matt, we've got, uh, we've got seven minutes, so maybe we could move right. to the conclusion so that we can uh, try and squeeze in sure. some of those questions as well. Okay, main thing, of course it's strong. You know, they're saying, oh, the um, compound annual growth rate is going to be 11%, 11.5%. I got to cheat and look at the day. I think through 2028. Well, I don't know. Every time you, you, you put something in like that, it's going to grow. I, not myself alone, but myself and some others, I think it's going to come down to single digit. But that might be offset by um, these new emerging countries coming out strong. And not just the emerging countries. The big guys like China that has the money. But there's going to be a recalibration. We've got too much capacity in some cases, even for the new projects, the new drug therapy classes. It won't be, I don't think, the bloodbath that we found in 2009. Consolidation, collaboration. Uh, you know, drug prices always, they're threatening. It hasn't happened yet, but it's on their table. They're, they're, they're aware of it. Precision medicines, targeted medicines, it, it's proving to be a very successful venture and people are willing to pay it and the insurance companies are being pressured to pay it, all those advanced therapies. Um, the spending, you know, if you don't come with the curve and keep investing to modernize your plant and meet all the mandates that are out there, 
you won't be in business very long. It, you'll get hit with the dreaded 483 warning letters from the FDA, and plus, a, you, you can't be a um, you can't be behind the times. Much more. Please do not ignore the public sector. Do not ignore that. They're, the drug companies don't. You shouldn't either. What used to be ah, oh, it's just a university. They're manufacturing it. They are actually manufacturing it. They are working with the drug company. Lots of opportunities there. We already discussed this. It's happening. Will happen. But not to the expected degree. I will end that part with this. There was a huge clamor. Oh my goodness, we got to get everything made in the United States. Or, you know, whatever country you're in. Those bad people overseas. Whatever overseas you're buying it from. Reshore, protect ourselves. Well, think of COVID tests, the ones where you use the swab. Well, Abbott made a good one. They beefed up production. They reopened a plant in Maine. They hired another company that made Q-tips to make the swabs, and they were booming until like last October. And they said, we don't want, you know, there's no need for it anymore. And they asked the government, no, no, there's no need for it. So they closed the plant, laid off people. Well, then we're going to give away all of these free COVID tests to all the citizens of the United States. Unfortunately, Abbott, while they rushed to go fill the demand, they could not. So the largest percentage of those tests were made in China. So it's kind of the irony, which is the industry. It's a very ironic industry. Lots of opportunities. And if anyone has any questions, please ask. Yeah, Peggy, maybe we could bring you back in. I think we've got a few minutes now to um, cover questions. If we've got any coming in, thank yes, you. Yes, we do. Uh, thank you, Annette. Thank you very much for a great presentation. And we do have a little bit of time left, so let's try to get some of these questions in here. Um, I'm going to start with David. And David is asking, has IIR established a method of differentiating projects by stainless steel versus single-use equipment? Yes, the process that we use is within the scope when it's identified. Um, and where we identify it, we put it in the scope. It would have to be a keyword search. That's not ideal, but that's the way our system is. And a lot of our clients have great success with that. And um, we, we really are thorough in the pharma industry and the reports because of the nature of it. So your project name, it will also often be in the project name, but it will always be, when we've captured it, and we have recognized that it goes into the scope. Okay, uh, let's see here. Gregory has a question. He says, what is the state of the solid oral dosage form market? And he adds a little bit to this. He said, are companies relying more on the CMO or the CDMO or just expanding plants, building new to actually make these project, uh, products? Yeah. <laughs> I guess that's absolutely true. Um, don't be, that's why I don't want anyone discouraged by all the talk of the advanced biological. Standard pill production, yes, it's made in house, and yes, it is uh, done with CMOs, CDMOs, and they are building new plants. And I will admit, you know, you get caught up in that and you get kind of surprised to say, well, wait a minute. You know, I'll look at a project and go, you're telling me they're going to just make pills there? Yep. Capsules, we're seeing a lot of activity in the capsules. But um, no, that's solid. That's your small molecules. There's a need for that. We want the over the counter drugs. We want the antibiotics. You know, they may not be fancy, they may not be in the news, but they do keep people alive. So there will always be, and they're very affordable in most cases. Okay. Has um, Industrial Info heard about companies deferring projects versus continuing without delay, but based on the current cost escalation and also those supply disruptions and delays that we're seeing? Uh, the thing, the feedback I've gotten, and this is just opinion based on being in the industry, calling in the industry. I find them more worried. Now, not not some. You don't often go to build a project and then not have everything in place for what the working part. 
but there has been some worry about that. But it's more like they want new blood. They want new um, new suppliers. Yes, there are standard ones. There's certain ones you're going to go to for this. They have that part of the construction sewed up, the process equipment. But I find them more amenable to, we need this. Or, yeah, we're looking for contractors. Yeah, we're looking for subs. We need millwright. Um, there is a there is a problem getting labor to help build these. As far as the materials, I haven't had one outright canceled because they couldn't get the building materials. Whoever's got the most money is going to get it done, and pharma does have a lot of money. Some can be delayed, but we just haven't really seen what I expected. I thought there would be then we didn't slow down much during COVID. It's still kind of chaotic in the plants. They, a lot of people still work remotely and they've gotten rid of direct calls. All right, we have another question coming in. Uh, this one is from Sean. He says, what's the trend in overall annual capital investment in the industry going up, down, neutral, and by what percentage? Well, like I thought, it's kind of funny how it follows the market, you know, when you're looking at revenue. But it it does. It's going to keep going up. Sheer demand. But I would keep it in the, um, you know, I'd love to maintain 19, 20% growth year after year in our data. Um, and there will be those areas that get that as we expand. But um, I, I think single digits, 9, 10%. You know, there's others that, oh, no, it's 15 prime. I think I'm being uh, optimistic with that. Some of, you know, there's been some of the powers that be think it's lower. So where I mentioned that recalibration of everything. But there's going to be definite growth, but I think it'll be high single digits. And that's across the globe. Okay. And actually, there was a follow-up question to that, and you may have just answered it. Is it the area of the world that's growing much more rapidly than perhaps others? Where are we seeing the most projects? Oh, we're seeing it in, like I said, Africa, the Middle East. And there the governments are just, boom, spending money. But it's not just there. Virtually every country is putting in a plant. I mean, I look at some of these and I'm thinking, how are they going to build this plant? You know, well, they'll use solar panels or they're going to build the utility supply. Frame. That's what limits a lot of these. But I know in Australia, they're just banging it out. They're, we're tracking a lot of projects in Australia to serve different markets. Will North American project activity grow as fast? As some of the others, no, but it's not going to stop any more than Europe is. South America is finally, the whole Latin is finally growing, but they, they've been hampered by a lot of stuff. There's a lot of people that want to pull the trigger on that market, but it's too unstable right now. But it's climbing. It's climbing. Shaheen, I want to defer to you for just a moment to see if you have sure. some. I, you always have some questions on the tip of your tongue as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, for, for me, really, it goes back to um, looking at whether we saw any big waves of project cancellations. Now, if we just take a proxy of, of other industries, what happened during COVID, uh, we didn't see huge volumes of projects being cancelled or, or put on hold. Uh, but what we did see is a lot of extensions and push outs of the start dates uh, and also some of those already under construction projects, their completion dates finished. So what happened was, is as we came into 2021, we kind of had this sort of bulge, this build up of pent up spending that needed to be released. Now that will have worked its way through the market naturally. Uh, during last year, but the issue was we were then hit with a second wave of COVID, which kind of derailed things a little bit. But then also we had the the broader uh, issue of um, you know transportation and logistics bottlenecks. And so what we have seen is a is, is a real scramble for everything from materials, from you know right. equipment, uh, labour, uh, and that's really made all of the supply side to building and constructing. Um, infrastructure very very tight at the moment uh, and then hence um, 
we get cost in, hit cost inflation. Um, so Absolutely. the market is 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 still progressing, but it's extremely competitive at the moment. And I guess my question to you, Annette, is: Is there has there been a slowdown, particularly in let's say the grassroots developments, but some of the plant expansions have possibly moved forward because they can just sort of leverage and make use of the existing footprint that they've got? Um, no. Or is it actually in plant capital is 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 booming and, and, and that's the kind of spend that's moving It's still forward. booming, which is surprising to me at this point for all of those reasons you mentioned. But when the first wave came and they found out, ooh, we got to figure out what we're doing, uh, how we're going to do this. And um, they are high dollars. Of course, things have gotten more expensive. But I have not seen the wave of on hold or canceled projects that I expected. I have seen them moved out. Like I said, that one from yesterday for a CAR T cell therapy, there was planning to write a third, to do a third building, expand. Nope, because everybody was building it. So the reason isn't because they can't. They just think that that's the kind of pause we're seeing. We're going to wait and see what the market does. Now we got little ones that cancel. You know, some of the cannabis but no I haven't seen a a huge wave uh, of that and it's less than I expected very none of the big name projects but they do change I will say that they do change and I want to say to everybody right. uh, feel free to reach out to me if you have any further questions and I'll turn this over to Peggy thank you for spending this time with me Thank you so much, Annette, for a great presentation. And thank you, Shaheen, for always uh, having something very worthwhile to pipe in with. And hey, thank you to all the folks that were participating today. And thanks for such great questions. If for some reason we did not get an answer to your question, don't worry, because someone from Industrial Info will be in touch with you. They will make sure that you get an answer to your question. Um, also, I want to say big Special thank you to our sponsor for today's webinar, Aviva. They are a global leader in industrial software. And if you'd like some more information about their products and services, just go to aviva.com. We'd also like to invite you to take part in just a brief survey following the close today. Thank you so much for joining us today and have a wonderful day.